Hi, everyone, and welcome to Guitar Department Coffee Talk. I'm Kim Perlack, the chair of the Guitar Department, and we're here with Cheryl Bailey, assistant chair of the Guitar Department. How you doing? Ian Steed, the senior Guitar Department coordinator. Hello. And Larry Bayonne, our chair emeritus and professor of the Guitar Department. Hey, Larry. Hi. Thank you for having me. So the first question is the most important question. Uh, what is in your coffee? Like, what, what do you got today, Larry? Uh, well, the more important uh, thing is first, I'm using the Guitar Department coffee mug. Ha. Uh, it's not the Guitar Department coffee. It's, and it's, um, I don't put anything <laughs> in the coffee. It's just black and strong. Great. There we go. I like your style, Larry. Thank yeah, you. Too. I, um, uh, it helps me to, um, it doesn't help me play faster. It helps me think a little faster. Maybe, you know. I learned my style from Larry. Uh, I used to put cream in my coffee. And then when I started working with Larry, I went basic, basic, ah. traditional, black and strong. So cheers, cheers, cheers. to everyone. Um, so Cheryl, I think you have uh, the first question for Larry today. Yeah, well, Larry, I was really curious about what was your experience the first day on the Berkeley campus? I mean, you came as a student and, you know, what was that experience? If you, if you can remember just your emotions, or they could be excitement or you were scared or, you know, any of these things. What do you remember from that very first day? Uh, that's a long time ago. That's in 1967. I came as a, a guitar student. I had been uh, taking a lot of lessons uh, from different people where I grew up, and um, I was scared. I was I was kind of worried who I was going to meet, and I was going to be in a dorm, and um, it was um, was I good enough? Um, I had, uh, I was very lucky enough to get some uh, scholarship to come to Berkeley and uh, still the, um, uh, the worry about, am I, do I know the right tunes? Do I, do I have enough technique? What is that scale they're talking about? All those things uh, kind of worried me. And um, I was, uh, it was the first, the first day was coming to Berkeley and meeting students from other areas of the country, meeting um, not just guitarists. There weren't as many guitarists there. Were, they were overwhelmed that there were so many guitars. I was, there was 30 guitars, I think. It was overwhelming. They didn't know exactly, you know, it was a, a, a big band school at the time, you know, and a jazz school and acoustic music, um, acoustic jazz. Wow. So anyway, I met people from different areas of the country and different experiences, bass players and drummers, and uh, hearing them talk about some musicians that I didn't know about that were uh, or the most um, uh, how, um, the most current uh, Miles Davis album, you know. And so I had been listening to Miles Davis, but mostly guitars I was listening to. So there was an experience that I had in that uh, I went, went on a Friday, took my audition. I was lucky enough to uh, do okay. I knew how to read uh, that, uh, and I was able to read. Uh, my audition was with Bill Levitt, the chair of the guitar department. He made me, he said, hi, my name is Bill. And I said, hello, Mr. Levitt. So, uh, <laughs> I, and that can continue on for my career as a student and the beginning of, of my uh, uh, tenure as a teacher. But the first, um, the first weekend, that night, um, I was told that, well, nothing's going to happen uh, for the rest of the uh, weekend for, uh, for your students. So you're in the dorm and you can do what you want. And I lived, uh, my parents lived about 100, 120 miles away. I called up my father. I said, gee, you know, I could take a bus home if you want. And he said, no, I think you should stay there. So I, I stayed there. And the next night we were all in the uh, dorm looking at television in the, uh, in the uh, 
access room for that. And someone said, um, is there an accordion player here? Uh, we need someone playing accordion. No one raised their hands. I said, well, I play guitar. They said, we're playing a gig in about an hour and a half and uh, we need someone to play chords for us. I went, okay. So uh, I, um, uh, they were, um, they were, I think, fourth year students and uh, they picked me up in the car from the dorm and we went and played actually an early gig and a night gig. And I learned that I didn't know enough tunes. You know, we played a lot of blues and a lot of tunes. You know, the, it was at a club and they said, okay, we want something. Uh, what do you want to play? I went, when Sonny gets blue, you want to play that? Uh, and they said, okay, we'll play that. It doesn't go with this club, but uh, we'll play that and we'll play some other things. I learned some things. It was a horn player, a uh, ten good tenor player and a, and a drummer. And uh, I'm glad I stayed that weekend because I jumped in and started playing with people. That's great. That's great. Ian, I think that kind of uh, leads into something that was on your mind. Yeah, I mean, so you were a student and then as we know, you became a faculty member of the guitar department, but then you were also the chair. So you've had a lot of different roles in the guitar department and as a musician at Berkeley. Um, and I think that so much of what happens like when you're you know, a student and you just first get there, maybe you don't know all the things that maybe you know, you might be hip to later. And, uh, you know, you really don't know what you don't know, right? So I guess my question is, what would you have asked if you went sort of back in time? Or what do you think that like a student should ask that they don't know to ask? Well, I think uh, something that's very important that uh, I wish I asked when I first started was, uh, how do I best use my practice time? Mm. Um, um, how do I organize? Uh, when you get to Berkeley, it's all music. And first of all, you can get uh, overwhelmed by what to do, what I need to do. How do I start? Uh, what, do, what, what do I practice first? You know, uh, uh, and how do I get a routine going? And um, I, some, I bring that up with students now that seem like they're scattered and they go in one direction for a little bit and they go, you know, and no, I didn't get to that. And, you know, so my, to my guitar teacher, I should have said like, okay, what should I start with every day? What should I, what should I, um, put as a, a warm up. I didn't even think about warming up at that time. It's like, oh, I got I have to be able to spell these chords. I have to know what the Phrygian scale is. I have to, you know, and and uh, and then I have to read and then I have to write an arrangement in uh, um, so how to use my my practice time every day and what what I learned was that I shouldn't practice two hours at once at first. I should practice by make some time during the day or in the morning and sometime in afternoon or evening. So there's less time in between that I don't have my guitar in my hands. And maybe the morning is to work on my scales or my chords, my craft on the guitar, you know? Um, um, uh, arpeggios, uh, warm up, um, reading, and then devote a certain amount of time later on to work on my repertoire. And, um, and there's also about not pushing it, you know, like uh, Mick Goodrick told me once um, uh, when I was taking lessons with him just play this every day and it'll get better. Mm -hmm. Don't try and get it that first day perfect. It'll get better if you look at it and play it every day. And it does work. 
Repetition works. I didn't know that. You know, I thought it was like grit my teeth and just play as hard as I can and uh, don't be um, happy until, uh, you know, I get it that at that time. Um, so that's, that's a question to ask. And the other thing is to tell yourself, I am where I am and what I'm doing is going to get me better and to believe it. Right, because if I, if I just look at my improvement right now, for this there might be some improvement, and then go the next day and it's taking a little step back. I can say, well, I guess you know I shouldn't be playing the guitar. It's it's really um, cumulative, and giving yourself a break and not getting down on yourself. There were too many. Uh, fellow students that I felt were talented that didn't have the patience and also put themselves down too much that stopped playing or left school when I was there. Yeah, you know, I, I, it helps to think about all the things that you've said so far are really constants when you think about they're specific to your experience at Berkeley, but everyone has that moment, I think, when they step on campus and they feel nervous. Everyone has that moment where they think like, should I be here? You know, where is this leading? And then an unexpected opportunity comes up to play a gig. And you don't think that your life is gonna work that way, but it does. And and it's these basic things that about practicing and that keep us all on track. And as you were talking, Larry, I was thinking that so many people think about the guitar department and I think they think about you in particular as someone who's written these books with Bill Levitt, going through his books and editing them, making records, playing a lot of gigs, developing the guitar department when you were a chair by either teaching a lot of the teachers who are here with us, teaching a lot of the alumni who went on to have huge careers, um, and also adding styles, developing pedagogy, and they think of it as so big, you know, it's become this sort of legendary part of the music community and the guitar world for sure. And so I, I guess my question next to you is, what are some other things that you see as constant in all that change and development that you've been a part of at Berkeley? What are some things that younger players should know, like here are some constant things that haven't changed that are important in your practicing or playing? What stands out to you in that way? Constance, yeah. Um, I think that, uh, well, first, I, I just wanna say that all the change in the guitar department and development of the guitar department comes with the faculty in the guitar department. All right, and that the faculty are the ones that uh, make this um, department uh, so special. And the Berkeley community as a whole, what makes the, the uh, both uh, students and uh, faculty um, and administrators all work together to try and uh, make the best possible education for the students and for them to achieve. So it's, it's really um, a, um, a really a team effort, a team effort. And uh, what's constant is the guitar, right? It's the guitar right. and the Rosetta Stone of the fretboard, right? We need a Rosetta, we don't know. When we pick up the guitar, we start doing fingerings, right? And we start, uh, Oh, this shape, that shape, uh, this, you know, dots. And um, <laughs> so I think that's a constant to start with, mm -hmm. right? It's a constant to learn a fingering, a uh, scale fingering. The next constant is to know what you're playing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and to know uh, specifically what you're playing and what that fingerboard, really, they, we call it fretboard, we call it fingerboard. What these 
making the string shorter, uh, what the sound is and what the note is and to connect with it. Um, so to me, the constant is learning the instrument. Uh, and then there are many other constants uh, uh, that are individual for, I want to learn a style. I want to learn more about a number of styles. So uh, to me, it's getting the, the instrument together and then uh, getting it enough that you can adapt your playing to, um, to a style that you like. Um, and it doesn't have to be the style for your life. It can be the style for now, and then you get interested in something else. But the better you know this instrument, uh, you know, let me pick it up. This, All right. You know, and to know that you can play a G scale here and a G scale, right? Yeah. Right? And, oh, uh, but what note? is this, you know, and oh, is that the same note, right? Right. Over there. So it's, 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 uh, it's a hard instrument to visualize. Right. Right? Um, I'm not saying other instruments are easier, but it's a hard instrument to visualize. So me, uh, I guess I keep repeating my, is to learn the instrument uh, and to trust your teacher. Mm -hmm. To trust your teacher to, um, uh, to go with the path that uh, you're with a teacher, to go with that path and give it a chance. Right. I guess I could, you know, there are many other uh, constants like uh, keep listening to people playing, you know. Uh, learning a style is not learning the words, I play this scale on this chord. Learning is... Uh, that's one. The other thing is, let me listen to this guitarist. Uh, what you know? Uh, let me listen to this horn player. So, you know, the other big constant is diving into the music. Right. Do you, Do you think of? Could you think of something specific that you learned at Berkeley from either a teacher or a student that just sticks out to you? that you feel like, oh, that was a moment and you use that all the time? Um, wow, there are, there are a lot of things that I could uh, think about. Um, one of the ones is um, try to play everything musically, mm -hmm. whether you're playing a scale, whether you're playing um, an exercise, um, uh, use dynamics in everything. Um, notice, um, um, record yourself and listen to it and see if it's musical. Um, and uh, I think that, I say that a lot to um, uh, my students uh, that, gee, everything is like one level, you know? There's a lot more than one level of sound. There, there's a lot more than uh, loud and soft, you know, there's in between. And there's, there's uh, natural dynamics going up a scale and down a scale. Everything should be connected. Uh, that's the other thing is uh, working on playing legato uh, because uh, the instrument, our hands get stronger that way and we, we, um, we get more control. We, staccato we can, we can work with because it doesn't take as much strength, but if you want to, uh, develop your strength, you, uh, you know, try and connect all the notes together and the chords. Uh, the other thing is that, um, you know, when playing a, a solo guitar and you have this thing of, uh, you have the quote unquote permission of playing rubato, <laughs> there is still, should be some sense of time in your rubato, some sense of, uh, of, um, um, how should I say, um, um, cadence. You know, it's like, we don't slow down because this is a hard part. We slow down because this is where it should slow down, not because I have a slow, um, um, 
I get uh, messed up with my fingering, I'll slow down there. The thing is of having that control. That's great. That's great. Cheryl, I think you had a question um, that still ties right back into what Larry's been talking about. Yeah, Larry. Um, I'm just curious about some of the musical connections you made as a student. How, you know, obviously coming together and jamming and working on music, how during that time it affected your development, the things that uh, you got from that. And also how that later on th that those uh, friends that you were doing gigs with or, or on, in your ensembles and jamming with after hours or whatever became your professional colleagues and also still growing musically with them, but also as your careers grew, maybe some of those people that was or, or how that affected your, your musicality and, and the direction of your career. Yeah, I, uh, when, when I came to Berkeley, uh, people were playing, uh, there were many places to play, you know, and they were, uh, so, you know, those two people that I played with that uh, first weekend that I was a student at Berkeley, I played some more gigs and I played a jam session. I was able to uh, meet other musicians and, um, and get to play actually different styles and learn from them. Uh, I was very lucky at the time that um, I, there were a lot of people that wanted to play together and I was lucky that um, there were some really great musicians. I, I met um, Richie Cole when I was uh, a student, a great uh, alto saxophone player, um, and I played uh, uh, an ensemble with him, and then um, later on, um, when I was in uh, Washington, D.C. area, uh, I'll mention that in a minute, how I got there, I um, was able to play with him at uh, certain, certain times. Um, and when you know one musician, you know, then, oops, I dropped my pick. I'm always holding my pick. Wait a minute. Sorry, no. uh, I dropped my pick, uh, and I got a pick that... Uh, you're not supposed to drop anyway. You're so, always ready. You're always <laughs> ready, ready to play. Ready, yeah. right? <laughs> so I, I always, um, I've been lucky that when I was in my second or third year, we, I joined, I was in a number of different bands. And one of them was a, a band that played, we wrote our own arrangements and did some copies to um, like the Blood and Sweat and Tears at the time. And we would play these with horn, I played with horn players and we played um, also soul music and we played a lot of soul clubs. Uh, actually, um, I'm glad we don't have these uh, movies of it because we were doing dance steps while we were playing at that time, <laughs> you know? So you learned your parts and you- I played. wish there was a movie of that. that <laughs> if, yeah. if there was a movie of that, Cheryl would be putting it on Throwback Thursday. All right, and you know, that's why I'm happy there's no more. <laughs> All right, so um, I made connections with that, with people with that. And actually, um, in my fourth year at Berkeley, they had um, the draft lottery. Mm. And the draft lottery, my roommates, two roommates, one got 300 and the other one like 289. And my draft number was seven. Larry, now you realize, please tell the younger people what you're talking about, the draft lottery. Right. The draft lottery was during the um, administration of Richard Nixon. It was during the Vietnam War. And they were drafting uh, students, or they were young men at the time that um, were not in school that didn't have any deferments, didn't have, um, weren't married and had children. So when I was in my second year, there was a draft lottery and they picked out numbers and it, the numbers would go higher as they would need more people. And definitely they needed people above seven, you know, so my number was seven. And 
uh, but I was at school. I was at school, and I um, I was uh, a music ed student, and I was doing practice teaching, and I was playing some gigs and taking at uh, lessons every semester. And uh, my um, when you graduated, if you didn't have uh, deferment or uh, you would, they would take you at that, at the time when you weren't in school. So I graduated Berkeley. Uh, I was in my four, last month at Berkeley and I was taking a lesson with Bill Levitt and there was a knock at the door and there was an army recruiter. Mm -hmm. And they said, we're looking for a guitarist for the army band uh, in, in Washington, D.C. And I, um, uh, we need someone to play uh, uh, jazz in the big band, combos, and also um, in the strolling strings for the White House. Mm -hmm. Tell them so, a little bit about that, what that means, the strolling strings for the White House. The strolling strings in the White House is that there would be a guest at the White House dinner and um, the staff in the army uh, band would write out an arrangement that, that you would play and memorize with, um, it would be guitar, accordion, uh, bass, and cellos, two cellos that would be sitting down and the rest of the violins, which were about 15 or 20, would be strolling around the room during dessert at, at the, uh, the uh, at the White House dinner. There were a lot of gigs for accordion players back then. There sure were. And there were, <laughs> uh, when they came back to Boston at that time, there were, accordion was a portable piano, mm -hmm. you know? So Larry, so, when, when you took that position in the army, you had to enlist and go through basic training and all that as well, is that right? Yes. I'm trying to wipe out that memory from my mind. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was in uh, basic training. Uh, so the thing I wanted to say was that, uh, also wanted to add was that I auditioned in that room for that, for that gig. And wow. they said, well, you're going to have to also audition in Washington. You'll, if you're a finalist, you'll audition in Washington, D.C. So, uh, at Fort Myers in Arlington, Virginia. And I, um, I was a finalist and I went down and flew, it might've been two weeks after I got married. And uh, I went in my training from Berkeley about reading and listening and knowing some tunes and playing with other people and playing, uh, uh, you know, blending with people and all. I read the part okay, I blended, I got the gig. So um, I spent my three years, very, very luckily in the army band that, that actually continued my education from Berkeley. Mm -hmm. I was able to use a lot of the stuff and have it really, uh, the, the information and what I got from Berkeley really help me out and help, help me to even continue learning from it, from what mm -hmm. I, from what it was. Can you go back for one minute? When, did you just say that you had that first audition in the room? Does that mean when the recruiter came into your lesson? Is that when you had the audition? Yeah, he wanted to hear me play. So, I mean, that's pretty powerful if people are paying attention to the story that you had to be ready to do that audition for that job that really changed your life at that moment in your lesson when I'm that person walked in. That. Yeah, I'm getting yeah. overwhelmed just by thinking about that, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, isn't that something that, that you were ready for that? You know, probably because of all the things you talked about, about practicing and having a plan, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, luckily, I was... Uh, uh, feeling good that day, and I played the right <laughs> tune, maybe. I don't know what I played. I know I had to play a chord solo, and he did bring some music for me to read. Um, you know, uh, 
And by the time I got out of uh, the army, the you know, um, I was uh, I had a lot of experience, and uh, I've learned a lot. In addition to my Berkeley studies, I'd be about how to um, audition and how to uh, continue rehearsing and how to uh, work at my instrument and my music. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I have to say about Berkeley, what uh, uh, Cheryl mentioned about connections. Uh, learning from your uh, fellow students is as much the um, learning process as it is in your classes. I was lucky that I played in uh, uh, some recording sessions uh, with Abe Laboreal, um, the wonderful human being and person and, and bass player. Um, I was lucky to uh, play with um, um, all these other great um, musicians that maybe aren't the names that we're talking, that we know, but are the people who, who went in. And Al Silvestri, who a, was a wonderful guitarist that wrote, writes all these movie scores. And, uh, um, and to hang and play with people. Yeah. Um, so uh, they really shaped my, also my uh, idea of where to go, how to get better. Wow, that guy's time is amazing. How do I get that, you know? And stuff like that. I have one for all of us, like for me and Cheryl and Ian in particular. I, I'm interested now that you're an emeritus and you're looking back on all your years as chair in specific. How do you think being a chair at Berkeley shaped the way that you play? Did it, did it affect you as a musician, as a performer? Yeah, it definitely did. Uh, sometimes when you uh, uh, play, uh, when you teach, you're concerned with your students <laughs> And you go to the room, or we have the students come to us online, and um, you don't meet all the other teachers. Uh, you don't. Uh, you hear the people, and you, you know. When I started teaching, I, I was playing with Jim Kelly, who was right next to me, uh, and uh, John Damian, and all these uh, great musicians, uh, great guitar teachers, too. Um, but um, being a chair, I was exposed to all the music and the wonderful playing of, of all the uh, excellent musicians in the guitar department. And uh, I would hear them play. I would go to some concerts. I would, uh, I, um, I would uh, students would talk to me who had, uh, have these other teachers and say what they were working on. And, so it gave me an overall view of music, you know, mm -hmm. and appreciation of the not only the styles but the different approaches. To to I pick something up from this person, you know. I heard, and I, you know, we I talked with another teacher. I talked with Rick Peckham. I talked with uh, Brett Wilmot. I talked mm -hmm. with, you know, uh, um, and I. Even the, even in the process of searches, I would learn right. from different people on how they would approach playing the guitar and teaching the guitar. It gave me, uh, um, it widened my scope. That's fascinating uh, to hear you say that. I think that's definitely true for me because I came as assistant chair to work with you. And I think that's a huge difference for me now is I'm more open. And I think it in an interesting way, it made me more confident and more grounded because I could be more open and learn from different people. And um, I'm wondering like in the coffee group here, like Cheryl, 
you were a student and a faculty member for many years and now assistant chair and Ian, you were a student and then you went out and played for a few years and then came back and this and part of our leadership role in our department. I'm wondering how you're both um, sort of hearing what Larry's been saying and how that sounds to you with your experience. Like Cheryl, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, I think what Larry said is exactly my experience because also I lived in New York and I commuted, so I wasn't in Boston. I would just literally, if, if you weren't on either side of my studio, you really didn't exist, you know what I mean? Like, um, you were in a three people department, right? <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> and, and you were on the end, you were in 440. I know, right, right. So yeah. so that's definitely true. And, and so now just, you know, being here in Boston and being on campus, yeah, and just really being blown away by the depth of everyone's approach to the instrument and the creativity of everybody's approach to the instrument. So yes, now I get to take that in and it definitely feeds me and gives me a lot of inspiration. What about yeah, you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, obviously like I was never in the roles um, uh, the two of you were, but I mean, the idea of the blinders, you know, and that I think that, um, you know, keeping the perspective in mind, particularly as a student, um, you know, uh, you get so wrapped up into whatever you've been working on that week or that day. Like I remember just like spending unbelievable amounts of time in the basement of the 150 building because there was these practice rooms where you didn't need to sign up. They were just old, you know, weird little areas with broken <laughs> pianos in them where they, where they put them. And it was like a secret area aside from the nice practice rooms where you could go find one. And I remember just spending so much time down there and really just being, you know, laser focused on this one little thing. And I could have used a lot more perspective. And that also ties into what Larry was saying about, you know, when you're first a student, really understanding how to practice. And I guess that's one thing that's really changed since being um, in this role is you know managing other things because in my normal job I'm not I don't have the guitar in my hand all the time so like really I actually got a lot better at practicing things that I understood intellectually maybe about how to practice but really not putting them into effect as much as I could have as a student right uh, Larry what would you say to students now who are looking at you know this time where we're in the pandemic and they're worried about their career moving forward and they kind of think they knew what they wanted to do. They think they had an idea of what they were going to be doing after Berkeley and now things seem to have shifted. Do you have any advice for them sort of looking back at your own career from that perspective of maybe what you thought you'd end up doing and how things developed for you over the years? Well, you never know what's going to happen, and that, um, yeah. and I think that um, I think it's almost like a calling. You get um, you need to go with what, how you're feeling about you. This this world needs music, right, um, and art, and there's always going to be a need for that. Sure, you might, uh, some circumstances might change, but there's always, uh, there's always the need. And uh, well, as, especially at Berkeley, there's always going to be, sh you're always going to be shown how to show your music, how to uh, spread your, your uh, art. And whether it right, whether it's you know playing clubs, like there used to be many many. Whether it's recording, whether it's um, uh, streaming, whether it, it those things will change. But the need for our art and music will I don't think will ever change. And I think it's it's uh, I know that uh, when the pandemic started. I was talking to a friend of mine in Baltimore who has is close to a student who 
is a, uh, a cellist. And the cellist said, uh, I don't know why I'm going to school, want to go to school now because, uh, what, because of what's happening now. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I did write to the student and said that music is always needed, especially now. Now, uh, but uh, how it's going to be performed and all, we can adopt, ad adapt ourselves, but our training is essential to the future. And I would encourage people. Now, you might be a, uh, a funk guitarist and say, well, how long is funk going to be going on? Um, I just picked funk. I, I'm not <laughs> saying that. But I'm, what I'm saying is that you're going to come to Berkeley or you're, and you're going to develop. And music is going to be always changing. But there are, you know, there are things that don't change, like learning your instrument, learning about music, about, about honoring the past, right? And working in the present and um, being innovative for the future. And I think it's important that you continue your journey and not stop it because of circumstances that will change. I agree. I think that's really wise. Um, and I think that's kind of a nice note to maybe... Can I just say one other yeah. thing? Yeah. The other thing is I also play guitar for myself. Right. It's right. I don't play only to go out there. I love performing and actually when I perform, I play for myself too. But picking up the instrument and, and continuing playing and making music is my way of, it could be meditation. It, it, to, it's my way of living. So that's, impo that's enough importance to me for me to continue playing it all. That's what I wanted to say. That's even more wise. I mean, <laughs> um, any last thoughts? From that Cheryl? was almost my or, last song. Oh, I right. know. <laughs> oh, Maybe I'm, or I'm more. I'm talking too much, right? right. No, it's Go great. Ahead. I we could let's pour another. Let's make another pot of coffee. Oh, Keep going. Okay. But, <laughs> um, but Cheryl or Ian, do you have any other thoughts that you want to bring up in the hang? I, I think that was really, uh, really important. What you said, Larry. Very deep and profound. I mean, my, you know, I I agree with you. I often think or talking to a student about practicing. And I think what what's the better use of your time than developing this amazing skill and and really a gift that you're giving, you know? I mean, what, what else are you gonna do with your time that would be more fulfilling or worthwhile? So I, I love, I love, but I love the way that you put that. I think it was well said. Chair Emeritus, Larry Beyond. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, I, I think so. I agree. I mean, I think this time has been a good time for all of us to really think about what's important to us and um, and that we can play because we love it. We play because it's who we are and that there is a constant, as you said, that the guitar is a constant. And so as we learn to adapt, we still have that. Yeah, yeah. Um, my relationship with guitar is my longest relationship. <laughs> yeah, you know I won't say how many years but it's a long long time that's great Ian a final thought from you uh, I'm glad you didn't pick up the accordion oh yeah thank you <laughs> <laughs> well that's great thank you so much Larry for My being pleasure. our first coffee talk hang cheers coffee, coffee cheers talk. to everyone and uh, we'll see you next time. Go practice. Yeah.